Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. So I think we are doing good in our um, course advancing at a good good speed. Uh, this is a continuing eighth week, and we are on the last lecture of this week, talking about Nixon, President Nixon, and President Ford, and how the circumstances took shape that Ford could become a president. Nixon took office in 1969, and he projected uh, an image of calm and deliberate statesmanship. He did not make any strong promises of very startling changes, proposed no important new legislation. Indeed, he accepted more or less uncritically the New Deal, new deal, new deal approach to managing the economy. And he was more concerned with the solution of the Vietnam problem. And he, think, he thought that it was his chief task. Nixon first proposed a phased withdrawal of all non-South Vietnamese troops to be followed by an internationally supervised election in South Vietnam. The North Vietnamese rejected this scheme and insisted that the United States withdraw its forces unconditionally. If the United States could not prevail with a half a million its forces, then how the North Vietnamese negotiator asked Henry Kissinger, who was the American negotiator, can you succeed when you let your puppet troops to do the fighting? The question Kissinger later admitted tormented him. And the president responded to this dilemma by trying to build up the South Vietnam armed forces so that American troops could pull out without South Vietnam being overrun by the communists. The communism and its fear has been some something for Americans. He shipped so many planes to the Vietnamese that they came to have the fourth largest air force in the world. The trouble with this strategy called Vietnamization was that for 15 years the United States had been trying without success to make the South Vietnamese capable of defending themselves. These steps did not quite American protesters. They raised their voice to shouts. On October 15, an anti-war demonstration, Vietnam Moratorium Day, was organized by students and led to an unprecedented outpouring of protest all over the country. This massive display produced one of the vice presidents, Agnew's most notorious blasts of adjectival invective. He said that the moratorium was an example of national masochism led by an a feet core of impudent snobs who characterize themselves, who characterize themselves as intellectuals. More protests started to join in. For a while, events appeared to vindicate Nixon's position. A gradual slowing of military activity in Vietnam had reduced American casualties. Troops withdrawals continued in an ordinary fashion but in a very orderly fashion. A new lottery system for drafting men for military duty eliminated some of the inequities in the selective service law. But the war continued. Early in 1970, reports that in 1960, an American unit had massacred civilians, included dozens of women and children in a Vietnamese hamlet known as Mai Le, revived the controversy over the purpose of the war and its corrosive effects on those who were fighting. The American people, it seemed, were being torn apart by the war, one from another according to each one's interpretation of events, many within themselves as they tried to balance the war's horror against their pride, their detestation of communism and their unwillingness to turn their backs on their elected leader. Perhaps Nixon's array uh, of thinking lies in the error 
about his unwillingness to admit his own uncertainty, something the greatest presidents, one thinks immediately of Lincoln and Franklin Roosevelt, were never afraid to do, to do so. Facing a dilemma, he tried to convince the world that he was firmly in control of events, with the results that at times he seemed more like a high school valedictorian declaiming sentine, <laughs> sentiously about the meaning of life than the mature statesman he so desperately wished to be. So he heightened the tension between America, Vietnam and elsewhere. But in all these actions, aggressive actions, Nixon and his national security advisor Henry Kissinger devised a bold and ingenious diplomatic offensive executed in nearly complete secrecy from even the state and defense departments. Nixon and Kissinger made an effective, though not always harmonious team. They were both so self-centered that they did not always trust each other. Kissinger, who kept track of his own staff by bugging their phones, accused Nixon's top aides of doing the same to him. First, uh, Nixon and Kissinger, aside from all this, secretly um, agreed to send Kissinger secretly to China and the Soviet Union to prepare the way for summer summit meetings with the communist leaders. Both the Chinese and the Soviets agreed to the meetings. So in February 1972, Nixon and Kissinger, accompanied by a small army of reporters and television crew, flew to Beijing. After much dining, sightseeing, posing for photographs, and consultation with Chinese officials, Nixon agreed to support the admission of China to the United Nations and to develop economic and cultural exchange with the Chinese. As a result, export to China increased substantially, reaching 4 billion in 1980. Among other American products, the Chinese were introduced to Coca-Cola, marketed under a name meaning tasty happiness. And let me remind you here that Pakistan government under Bhutto was basically very instrumental in sending Kissinger to China in this secret mission. In May 1972, Nixon Kissinger flew to Moscow. This trip also produced a striking results. The mere fact that it took place while war still raged in Vietnam was remarkable. By the summer of 1972, with the presidential election looming in the fall, Kissinger redoubled his efforts to negotiate an end to the Vietnamese war. By October, he and North Vietnamese had hammered out a settlement calling for a ceasefire, the return of American prisoners of war, and the withdrawal of United States forces from Vietnam. Shortly before the presidential election, Kissinger announced that the peace was at hand. In 1973 also, Kissinger was named Secretary of State and he did receive the Nobel Prize for Peace. The economy under Nixon um, in 1969 went the, through a major economic problem he faced was inflation a 7.9% devaluation of the dollar in December 1971 helped the economy by making American products more competitive in foreign markets. In handling other domestic issues, the president was less firm. After his triumphant re-election and the withdrawal of the last American troops from Vietnam, Nixon turned to domestic issues, determined that he made clear to change the direction in which the nation had been moving for decades. But in March 1973, James McCord, a former agent of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, F F FBI, accused of burglary, wrote a letter to the judge presiding at his trial his 
precipitated a series of disclosures that first disrupted and then destroyed the Nixon administration. Most people took uh, the president at his words when he said that I can categorically, he announced in June 22nd, that no one on the White staff, no one in the administration presently employed was involved in this very berserk incident. But these um, revelations led to the more misgivings than any confidence building process. One result of the growing scandals and of Nixon's attitude was a decline in his standing in public opinion polls. They were calling for his resignation, even for impeachment. And yielding to pressure, he agreed to appoint of an independent special prosecutor to investigate the Watergate affair. And he promised the appointee, Professor Archibald Cox of Howard Law School, full cooperation. But the troubles were not lessening for Nixon. They were getting more and more. The nation had never been before experienced such a series of moral shattering crisis. While his seemingly unending complications of Watergate's by Nixon were unfolding during 1973, a number of unrelated disasters struck. The vice president, Agnew, defendant of law and order, foe of permissiveness, was accused of income tax fraud and of having accepted bribes while county executive of Baltimore and governor of Maryland. So this is not only our story. But the judgment on Watergate really shattered American political, not only the political smear of this time, but even the political expectations and people's uh, political ideals. In an effort to check the mountain criticism late in April, Nixon released edited transcripts of the tapes he had turned over to the court the previous November. And the publication of uh, the transcripts led even some of Nixon's strongest supporters to demand that he resign. And once the Judiciary Committee obtained the actual tapes, it became clear that the White House transcripts were in crucial respects inaccurate. And in summer of uh, 1974, after so many months of alarms and cries, the Watergate drama reached its climax. And uh, the pressure was mounting on Nixon to resign. But he would not resign. However, even if the House impeached him, he was counting on his ability to hold the support of at least 34 senators. But this Richard Nixon was found that there were unmistakably his fingerprints. The president's chief advisor then pressed him to release the material at once and to admit that he had erred in holding it back. And so this he did on August 5, when they read the new transcripts, all the Republican members of the Judiciary Committee who had voted against the impeachment articles reversed themselves. Nixon's own drama is and must remain one of the most fascinating and enigmatic episodes in American history. Uh, the explanation that he gave, however tentative, is at least comforting. It made him appear less menacing if it is correct. Americans can deplore the injuries he inflicted on society and still feel a certain compassion. After this... Uh, tragedy with Nixon, Ford uh, became the president and it was again his good fortune to become a president by default. Thank you. See you next week.